Ah, original, original, bad man. Ah, and uh, me get this song for them. Lego. Ah, original bad man. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel, Ashley Empowers. I'm Ashley, and thank you for tuning in to this episode of Single, Saved, and Secure. The purpose of this series is to showcase and highlight single men and women who are walking in their purpose and preparing for marriage. Today, I'm so excited to be interviewing Jay Barnett. He is a licensed family and marriage therapist, and he's gonna be sharing his journey of being single, saved, and secure. Now, before we hop into today's episode, I did wanna let you know that there is a free quiz that my husband and I created called the Are You Ready For Marriage Quiz to help you take an insightful look within to see if you are indeed ready for marriage. The link to take the quiz is in the description box below or you can simply go to marriageprepquiz.com. Now let's get into today's episode. Welcome, Jay, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Ashley. Thank you for having me. Yes, absolutely. So, Jay, can we just start off by you telling people who you are and what you do? Yes, absolutely. So, I am a licensed and marriage and family therapist, an author of four books, Letters to a Young Queen, which is for uh, young ladies, Hello King for Young Men, Finding Our Lost Kings and Queens, which are for parents, uh, teenagers, and anyone that work with young people, and also my newest book, uh, Identity Crisis, uh, which ranges from ages 10 and up. And also, I am an international speaker and the creator of a mentoring program, Knowledge is Necessary Power, which is an uh, acronym for KING, uh, which is a program that is in two HBCUs. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, and I love the titles of your books. So tell me about what sparked that passion for you to really develop these books and programs and curriculum to give back to the community. So what, what sparked my passion, I am the son of a pastor. I grew up, uh, my father was a Baptist pastor or is, he's been pastoring for 30 years and my mother was Pentecostal. So I kind of grew up in a very interesting dynamic of a household where my father was very traditional and my mother was very radical in their beliefs. And so for me, when my parents divorced, I felt like there were nothing, uh, there wasn't anything that was available to help kids, uh, myself and my sisters, understand the process that we were going to have to endure because of the divorce. And my father was a major pastor of a major church. And so we incurred a lot of hurt and pain, not only from just the church, but also just from inside of our family dynamics. And so to fast forward a little bit, that is kind of where a lot of my issues of depression, self-harm, suicide ideation, and all of those things that I began to experience. And so one of the passions that God gave me, even when I was a kid, I would always work in my father's church when there was a youth Sunday. So he would call on me, I would speak, um, I would help the kids do the call to worship. So I was heavily involved in church. And one of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to not only create a safe space for young people who had experienced what I had experienced growing up as a kid, or teens that needed to have an understanding of what they were processing emotionally and mentally. Because sometimes we forget about teenagers. Like we give a lot of attention to babies and we give a lot of attention to the elderly, but then you have this gap from, I'm gonna say 12 to about 25 that we really don't give attention to. Mm -hmm. And so for me, those are very pivotal years and they were very pivotal years for me and when God laid out literally through dreams and through visions on how I was to uh, construct these programs as far as emotional recovery programs, as far as uh, identity crisis, and that's what gave me, you know, that desire to create something for them because kids become what they see. Yeah. And many times what kids are becoming are not things that we want them to see. So. Yeah. I wanted them to see something healthy, something functional. Uh, more importantly, I wanted them to see beyond their experiences. So how old were you when your parents got divorced? 13. Okay. And so it's interesting because I myself, I didn't grow up in church and I didn't really give my life to Christ until I was about 21 years old. And before I got married, I thought I had this perception of, church and pastors that if their marriages are failing what gives me any hope because i wasn't i didn't even grow up in church so did you struggle 
or I guess being someone who grew up in the church and who your parents kind of threw you in leadership roles as a young child, did you have other, did you have any healthy examples of marriage growing up? Uh, not growing up, I didn't. And I'll be honest with you, probably most of the models that I saw was very dysfunctional because mm -hmm. here's what a lot of us do. And a lot of us, we adopt the models that we were given or the models that we function in for the reason that many people learn how to function in a state of dysfunction. And so I did not see healthy models, but when my mom moved up to Texas and I began playing football and I began hanging out, is when I met my best friend, Andrew Marr. He became a good friend of mine. I started going over to his house and his parents kind of took me in. And so I, it's, that's where I began to see a healthy family dynamic. They sat down at the table you know, we, you know, we, we, we were a great football team. So every week, you know, there was this excitement and expectation leading up to, you know, what are you guys going to do this week and how many points you want to score? And yeah. so in that family dynamic is where I learned how to communicate, you know, how was your day and how was, you know, school and those things. And that was the first model that I saw. And to be even more transparent, it was a white family. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I grew up in Mississippi, a very segregated, a very racist, and a very prejudiced environment. And then to come here, what we had learned traditionally that white people were not for us was the total opposite of my experience uh, here in Texas, because these were the same people who welcomed me in, yeah. showed me love, took me on my recruiting trips, took me on my college visits. You know, So my mother, who did the best she can, love her, amazing but she didn't have any understanding of like working with me as an athlete. And my godparents who later became my godparents, they were heavily involved with sports. And so that is where I saw a healthy model of, you know, he called his wife mother, right? Which I thought was odd at first, it's like, eh, this is weird. But, uh, but it was just the level of respect that they had and she called him father. And so, but then too. Wait, hold on, hold on. Look, so explain that to me a little bit. So they called each other mother and father, and it was just, you know, but as I, the, the respect value that they had for each other, they've been married now, I want to say, probably like 35 years. Wow. And, um, and just, but then again, if you go back to the scriptures, April, Sarah referred to Abraham as her Lord. So it wasn't an unhealthy thing. But when something is very abnormal to you, it's normal to, in someone else's setting. And with the, the God brothers that were my friends, that was normal to them. But it was the honor and just the respect they had for each other. And so that's why I saw a healthy model, uh, yeah. you know, for, for me, you know, growing up. And most definitely, I never saw it in church. I can tell you that. Okay. Yeah. So how did becoming a licensed marriage and family therapist impact your relations your perspective on relationships oh my gosh <laughs> this that question is layered and i'm gonna tell you why it's layered it's layered because it's a blessing and a curse i i dating i don't like to tell a woman what i do or what i am if you know from you read something or you google something and most times it's probably from the perspective or I know you used to be an athlete and I know you work with kids, but I'm very, I'm very apprehensive on sharing that I'm a therapist because here's what typically most people do. They think that you're analyzing them and everything. And, and I'm not because I, I, could, I, I literally could care less. But on the plus side, being a therapist allows me to have a greater understanding of people's functionality on how they see things because mm -hmm. many times we're meeting people who are functioning on their system that they that that they were reared in and it can be totally uh it could be be totally dis dismissive at times if you don't have an understanding of it that's why i think the communication and dating process is so important because dating is the phase where you want to collect data and you're not collecting data so i can judge and say no, you're just trying to get a better understanding of who a person is. Because most time, most of us are presenting a representative because we are waiting for the space where we can show the reality of who we are. Because you have to use wisdom mm -hmm. in that space. And 
peeling back the layers with people. And so in that space, I have to use a lot of wisdom and I have to use a lot of discernment. And there are times where I can see a pattern in what someone is saying because educationally and, and spiritually, I'm gifted in uh, the perspective of, I'm, I have a clairvoyant gift, so I can see things without people saying it. So I have to manage all of that because mm -hmm. I can listen to what someone is saying, but then I can also know that it's connected to an experience. Mm. And that's how most of us live our lives. And we mostly live our lives according to what has happened, yeah. what has been said, and who it happened with. And so I have to manage a lot of that because even for an example, when for I give an example, this lady said to me, how do you deal with being single, having a platform, and I'm sure a lot of women are always in your DMs. Now, that's not a red flag to me. That's a mental note. It's a mental note because for me, if you're interested in me, your interest is what I would be with you rather than, because again, for some people, there's a fear that if you're out in the public's view, mm -hmm. then I'm not sure if I can handle that. And so later on, I, we kind of uh, dove a little deeper in the conversation and it was connected to, well, I've dated athletes or I've dated these type of men mm -hmm. and they could not manage having women throw themselves at them. So that gave me a greater understanding of her question. Not that I was judging her question, but I'm the type of person, I like to know why you're asking certain things. And there's nothing wrong with asking that, but you know, which I think, Again, to answer your question, it's it's a it's a lot. It's, and then too, I'm a black male therapist, so yeah. that within itself, it, it sometimes it feels like it's a heavy load to carry. Yeah. And so, do you? So it sounds like you're able to again, kind of like when you're pursuing someone, not try to turn into their therapist. But oh no. You, okay, that's great. So, do you also? Is it easy for you to separate the story and the trauma that you hear? And does it still give you hope for your future marriage, or does it? Uh, it does give me. It, it does give me hope for my future marriage. Uh, one of the things that I do desire, I do desire a woman who's on her own journey of healing, uh, her journey of personal development, growth, her journey of constantly, or should I say, continuing to become. Mm -hmm. uh, I truly believe that life is not about what you get; it is about who you become. And I think that's a desire of mine because I feel like in the work that I do and the call that God has on my life, I'm constantly ascending. There's always another level. You know, I'm not who I was a year ago, you know. Uh, and so post-graduation, I have evolved into a whole different person now that I'm actually practicing, you know, in, in my field. And so for me, I have hope for someone who has their own therapist, coach, mentor, someone that is not only holding them accountable, but yeah. someone that gives them a different viewpoint and a different perspective. And so I'm able to separate because many people carry a lot of trauma that they're unaware of. And so if you notice, there's this, now all of a sudden mental health is, you know, emerging to where people are, I, I don't believe it's a way I believe people are realizing for the first time because this pandemic yeah. exposed a lot of unhidden issues that we have brushed over with being busy. Mm, yeah. You know, I, I've, I've seen a lot of relationships separate. Yeah. I've seen a lot of people lose their stuff because, and losing their stuff meaning that they could not hold it together because the pandemic mm -hmm. forced you to sit with yourself. So, yeah. So when it comes to the standards that you have and being that, you know, you're educated, you know what you want spiritually, there's a certain type of woman that you want that's that's progressing. So you guys don't outgrow one another. What are some of your non-negotiables in a relationship? Some of my non-negotiable is not having a relationship with Christ. I, I mean, that, that's, that's, so, that's a non-negotiable, man. I, I think, you know, again, not saying, and when I say this, because oftentimes when you, have, when you have done the work, 
you don't operate in the spirit of offense or in a state of offense. Mm. And so I want to make sure I clarify that because sometimes people can hear you say that, like, who's that guy I think he is? I'm like, no, 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 no. This is just, that doesn't, I'm, I'm not talking about you as a person, but for what I am called for, it's going to deem a woman to have a relationship with God. Because there are some times that God would be able to speak to my wife when he cannot get to me. That's why you have to be equally yoked. Not that we have to be under the same church, but we have to be under the same belief system. And so that's a non-negotiable. Um, I'm 38. I'm not oblivious to the point that, to the fact that if I met someone now that they probably have had a bad experience in a relationship, they may be divorced, they may have a kid. So those are things that I'm open to. Now, 10 years ago, I wasn't open to nobody having kids, right? I'm just like, I don't have no kids. Like, I don't want to be nobody's stepdad, you know. But you evolve and you grow. Now, I do have my limit. Yeah, one. Okay. I can <laughs> Okay. I can't do two because I because I do want kids. Okay. So uh, those are my non-negotiable. I feel like everything else, uh, and this is becoming more and more of a non-negotiable. I really desire a woman who knows what her purpose is. Mm. I really desire that, and I'm not saying it to where she doesn't have to be speaking. She doesn't have to be doing what I do. But if God has called you to open up a dog shop and you're going to beautify dogs, man, do. And that, that's like, that, I believe that relieves so much pressure from the other person who's function and purpose to feel like they have to stop to help this other person find it. Mm, that's so good. That's really good. So, this is a question that a lot of people that are single don't like, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Why do you think you're still single? You're 38 years old. You're a great catch. Why do you think you're still single? It, and, 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 and I think that's a great question for the people who think that is not a great question. I think it's a phenomenal question. I believe, because I've been engaged twice. So mm -hmm. I was engaged at 27, 28, and then I was engaged at 34. And I can tell you both times when I made the decision to get married, they were not for the right reason. The first time I decided I wanted to get married, it was because we had been dating for two years and I felt this is what you're supposed to do, right? You're supposed to get married. Yeah. Uh, second time I got married, it was, she had kids. I went against my whole two number rule and a uh, great person. But when I realized that we, I thought we were, connected but we were not equally yoked and this is why everything has to line up purpose has to line up the objective has to line up your assignment does not have to be your, your assignment has to be in an alignment it does not have to look the same i want to okay. clarify that we don't have to have the same assignment but it must be an alignment to how do we move together because i believe you have a purpose as an individual and then you have a purpose as your union, as what you two would do together. Because the union reflects what God is to us. He said he's married to the backslider, right? He says that, you know what I mean? He is, uh, uh, he called us the groom. So marriage represent and is symbolic to God and us as humans. And for me, I chose people who did not choose me. Mm. And here's what I mean by that. They were people who saw me, I like Jay, but I'm not sure if I can get with what Jay is called to do. Mm -hmm. Especially in my second engagement, right? Because I had been on this, I just wrote my girl's book, Letters to a Young Queen, and that book was really doing well, it was taken off. And we had an un honest conversation. She said, I would like for you to get a regular job and not do this speaking thing. Look. Wow. Okay. And I had to make a decision. We had a heart-to-heart a, a -heart conversation. She gave me a ring back, and we split ways. She's married now to the guy that she wanted. And what I realized is that sometimes, and, and, and this is what God spoke to me. God said, son, you have to get to a place where you are choosing your spouse based on what you're called to do and not choosing according to how you feel. Because, see, sometimes we can connect with people. Like, you got this whole thing, like, 
Yeah, I really vibe with them. Just because you vibe with those people does not mean that you guys are called to walk together. Yeah. But see, you can vibe with anybody. Right. Yeah. So being that you are 38 years old, I get lots of DMs, emails from women who are 30 plus who feel so discontent being that their time is quote unquote ticking. Do you ever feel insecure as a single man at 38 years old? Oh, no, no, man. Listen, oh, wow. Okay. My, my sister, listen, my sisters, it's funny you asked me this question. So every Sunday we get together, family day, both of my sisters are married with kids and they doing life. And, you know, I have a, I have an Irish twin. She's like, look just like me, but she's like your complexion. Mm-hmm. And, and so, and I had to tell my sisters, right, we're having this conversation because we've gone through a lot together. So we all feel very connected. And so oftentimes they are a little bit abrasive with their approach about, I should have what they have. And I said to them on Sunday, I said, listen, man, I love you guys. But I said, I truly believe that I was not called to do what you guys did and how you did it. And my sister's like, I just got this question I want to ask you. I just, you know, she followed up. Um, I just want to ask you this question. Like, I mean, do you even want to get married? And I said, and my sister's a very strong will, man. Lord Jesus, bless their husband, sanctify their souls, God, because I don't know how they do it. <laughs> but I said to them, I said, yes, I do. And my sister said, because I don't, Jay, I worry about you because you're always working, you're always doing that. I don't want you to get old and you not have. I said, listen, man, I'm, it's okay. Mm. I said, I'm not going to get old by myself. God is going to bless me with the woman that is called to me. I'm going to have kids. I said, I'm not on this clock. And so my manager calls probably 10 minutes after this. And my manager calls, says, hey, I got this deal on the table. This is major. This is a huge partnership. And she says the name of the company is very huge. They want to do this huge mental health rollout with a black therapist that used to be an athlete. So my sister was like, and so here's what I did. I used it at a teaching moment. I said, had I been married, this would not have happened Mm -hmm. because I was connected to someone who was not going to allow me to fully operate in my purpose. So for me, and God, God spoke to me. God says, son, you have to be connected to somebody who is going to allow you to fully operate in your purpose, but who is going to allow you to be moved by me because most of my stuff that I do is spirit-led. Mm. So there's a decision that I would make that, okay, I don't know, but I heard this. God spoke it, so we got to move on. You got to be with somebody who's confident in that space that I'm not trying to lead you down a rabbit hole. I'm just leading you according to what God has said to me. Mm -hmm. So when I broke that down to my sister, I said, it's okay. I said, life is not over for me, man. I said, I'm 38. Like, I'm not, I'm not old. Yeah. And I'm like, there's, I said, you know, every woman that's my age or whoever, they not on this soapbox and they're not on this time, you know, that I got to be married by this if I don't have kids because... I've met several women, like I met a woman recently, about two or three months ago, I just moved to Dallas. And I, this lady was like, let me hop on this real quick. No, no, listen, I don't blame the sister. And I was interested in it, but I was like, let's, let's take this slow. Literally, she said to me, Queen, I kid you not. She said, I need to know now because I am trying to have a kid within a year's time. And oh my I said to her, okay. this is why I said to her, I said, yo, listen, man, like I said, I really dig you. I think you're cool. Now she has a six-year-old son. Mm. And uh, and I said, I said, she said, well, the doctors told me that I have a window. And I said, I, I respect that. I'll be in prayer for you. Like she was serious. She was like, I have a window, Jay, and this is serious. Because and here, and I, I'm gonna be transparent, because we grown folks. She said to me, she said, what do you think about using condoms? I was like, shoot. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like what every man thinks about using condom? Like, who, who, what man wants to use condom? But you right, use yeah. condom um, if, if that's the situation. And, and I was trying to figure out where was she going with this. So she said, well, if it went down with you and me, I'm just saying, I don't want you to use a condom. And I was like, wait a minute, what you talking about? 
Oh, okay. so she, she was like, she was like, she literally said, she was like, yep, I'm trying to get one. Just like that. Wow. And I was like, whoa, no. I said, she was like, well, Jay, I'm just being honest. And I said, I respect your honesty and I respect the situation that you feel that you're in. Mm. But that's not for me. Like, I'm not, you know, that, that ain't that type of situation. Yeah. And so many times I have to tell clients, because I work with a lot of demographics of people from all walks of life. And I'm like, man, slow down. It's okay. No one has you on this, this time restraint but yourself. Mm. And so, you know, I, for me, I'm at peace. Yeah, no, and I can tell, especially from your answer, you seem very secure, you know, and hopefully the people watching this will get, will that will be contagious to them through this message. So one thing that you said that I like is that you're spirit led in all you do when it comes to your business, when you, when it comes to um, the things that God is calling you to do, it's not like someone's instructing you, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, which tells me if you have that type of connection with the Lord that you spend time with him. Now, a lot of men see worshiping God as a feminine trait. So let me tell you, so recently my husband and I um, went to like this prayer meeting in our community and a woman was like, yeah, I brought my fiance, but he thought, you know, this is kind of like a girly thing is what she said. And I thought that was very interesting because people were like, there were men there that were crying out because it was about a girl who had cancer and we were praying for her. And he tried, he was his posture was, you know, he didn't show any emotion. And my husband and I were having a conversation about how some men do perceive praying and crying out to God as a feminine thing. What are your thoughts on that? If I'm her, I ain't finna marry that dude. Yeah. Oh, anyway. anyway. You're right. <laughs> Listen, let me tell you something. I... I have a worship song that I use. I love praise music, instrumental praise music, man. Mm. Man, I'll walk through this house, a shout will break out, tongues will break out. Let me tell you something, many nights I laid in that floor and cried. And for people who know me, go look up my story. I'm a two-time suicide survivor. So listen, let me tell you something, I'm about this life for real. Yeah. When it comes to that, if he cannot surrender to God, what makes you think you think he will surrender to the process of marriage? Marriage is a surrendering process. A man that does not surrender to God, he cannot surrender to what marriage calls for because marriage calls for a sacrificial effort of dying to yourself daily. Worship is sacrifice. I am dying to myself. Think about it. When you're worshiping, your mind goes everywhere. That's why you have to, the, the Bible speaks about worshiping in spirit and in truth. Right. But you have to be willing to serve God with all of what your heart, soul, and mind, right? You have to be very conscious. Your heart, your soul, and your mind, your nephesis, which is the Greek, I mean, the Hebrew word of, 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 of soul. You have to be in tune. Mm. And it ain't, it's not based, it's not, worship shouldn't be looked at as, a generality thing, you know what I'm saying? It right. should be, no, I do this because I love God. I do this because I need God. I do this because he is owed this. Because the, 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 the thing about worship is like, you can't out love him. You can't. Loving us is what he does. That's just who he is. So to that young lady, I would have to reevaluate. Right. Because I like worship and I like private worship. Oh, man, I love private worship. I like to just get on my knees and get prostrate before God, man, and just give that thing in him. I like to spend time in tongue. I like to spend time just him downloading. Like, you, you got to have that. But then again, if you're not sure of your calling and of your salvation, then maybe that doesn't mean anything to you. Yeah, yeah. No, and I and thank you for touching on that because clearly you're secure in your singleness, you're secure in your relationship with the Lord. You see the importance of that. And I think it's amazing that, you know, 
you're really a great example of someone who has went through things, who has witnessed divorce, and clearly you've went through your own drama, your own trauma, because you said you were had two failed suicide attempts. If people want to learn more about your story, because we don't have time to get into that today, where can they learn more about that? So you can Google for one, <laughs> for all of the uh, technical people and uh but you can Google Jay Barnett, uh, but I have a website, jbarnett.com, j-barnett.com. And also my counseling website, online counseling, virtual counseling, coaching is kjbcoaching.com. Uh, I talk about my story a great deal in my book, Hello Kings for Men, because uh, God has really uh, shifted my, my work to where I am becoming an advocate for men healing and, and, and preferably for black men healing. Mm -hmm. And so I just have a heart for boys. I have a heart for men because so many of us as men have experienced so much trauma and we've experienced so much hurt, so much pain. And we have been told that we couldn't talk about it because it would emasculate us. And that if we cried, it would show that we're weak. If we express or if we vented, it would show that we you know what I'm saying? That maybe I got a question in my sexuality. And so I am working to debunk all of these different uh, things and, and, and de stigmatize these different stereotypes and, and different negative messages that men have heard. And so if you're in the Dallas area, I have to say this, every Saturday from 1 to 2.30, I am at the Dallas, I'm sorry, the Oak Cliff Chamber of Commerce working with men on emotional healing and emotional intelligence. And wow. so it's free. We, we, we feed the guys and it is beautiful to watch these men open up to get the healing, but more importantly, just to have the space. And so that's what I'm all about is providing people the space. Like when God, God spoke to me about four years ago and my homeboy hit me up probably like two months ago and, and reminded me, he said, bro, you remember you called me and you said, God told you to go back to school. I said, yep. Literally, God spoke to me and says, something is coming and you're going to be needed. Kid you not. Just like you and I are talking. When I tell you this, I have made more money during this time. I have done more interviews. I've done more, which I was already speaking. I've done more speaking engagements virtually. But what God was showing was that the same way that he did David, right? He does not take you to a place where he has not prepared you. Before David fought Goliath, he began fighting these small battles. Yeah. And I started in group home and foster care doing group therapy. And now I am doing that from a clinical perspective to where I can take men down these lanes from a place of strategy, from a, 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 a place of, of, of uh, conscious you know, a mindfulness, helping them to understand their childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. So I am just blessed during this time that God is using me as a voice and a vessel. Yeah. And I would just encourage everyone, man, listen, this, this ain't church service, but man, as my, I grew up in the South, as my grandma used to say, get to know the man. Get to know Jesus for yourself, man. Because I'm going to tell you something. Where we at in this time, you're going to need him. Mm -hmm. This empowerment movement, this stuff is not going to work for what we're up against. Yeah. You're going to need a prayer life. Mm. All this old motivation talk is not going to work when you're dealing with real demons and you're dealing with real issues. Yeah. Because spiritual warfare is real, real. And I don't know why God led me to go there, but yeah. just, you know, I, I really hope because if you're, if you're planning on being married, the enemy does not like marriage. Mm. And you have to go in that thing not based on the expectations and the idea that, because so many people romanticize about, oh my God, we're going to be yeah. baby goals, we're going to be black love goals, baby. You better make sure y'all can pray together. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, that's real talk. And I appreciate you touching on that. And I appreciate you sharing where people can find you. I'm going to leave all of that information in the description box below for anybody who is interested in attending one of Jay's events or um, doing counseling. I'm sure you probably do it virtually as well. Um, but really quick, let's do a, a quick, a few rapid fire questions and then we're going to wrap up here. Okay. Um, okay. So number one, who pays for the first date? The man. Okay. What's your dream job? 
Oh gosh, I think I'm doing it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Are you a morning or a night person? Morning, morning. What's your favorite hobby? Favorite hobby, working out. If you could go the rest of your life without doing one chore, what would it be? Sweeping the floor. Okay. <laughs> you need to get you one of them uh, remote. Oh my uh, God, I hate sweeping but... the floor. Man. Oh, it's, 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 it's so tedious, man. Yeah, yeah. I just, hate it. Yeah. Well, Jay, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. This was absolutely amazing. And um, I look forward to sharing it with the world. Awesome. Thank you for having me. You're welcome.